So what I want to present to you is kind of a counter narrative about activism. And it begins with Occupy Wall Street and realizing that Occupy Wall Street was basically the realization of our story of activism. You know, there's a story of activism that we tell ourselves, which is that if you can build a social movement with millions of people, and they have a largely nonviolent, that they are, that they have, that they cut across demographics, that you have people from all over the country and different socioeconomic levels, and that they have a somewhat unified message, then real change will happen. So we had that with Occupy Wall Street. We had a once in a generation social movement that achieved a lot of the um, so-called so criteria of what creates social change. And we realized, in fact, that it wasn't true. That Occupy Wall Street didn't create the social change that it, was, that it set out to do. And so I call Occupy Wall Street a constructive failure. It failed, but in failing, it revealed something very important about the way we think about activism, which is that we've been chasing an illusion. We've been chasing a story about how social change happens that isn't actually true. So if you look at the last 15 years, we've been having the largest protests in human history, and yet they haven't been creating social change. There was a protest in India with 100 million people. In 2003, we had, this is probably the best example to refer to, we had a global synchronized march where the entire world protested on February 15, 2003 against the Iraq war which happened anyways. And then of course we have Occupy Wall Street. We have the protests in Brazil in 2013. So these, these, the failure of these protests reveals that our story of social change that we've been telling ourselves and that we've been chasing after as activists isn't true. And I've been thinking about this and I've been writing a, a, a book now that's called The End of Protest. Now the end of protest doesn't mean that we have an absence of protest. It instead means that we seem to have a proliferation of ineffective protests. Protest, as it's originally supposed to be, which is something that um, changes the, the social situation in which we live, doesn't seem to be existing anymore. So what's our way out of this? And I'm gonna just kind of lead you quickly through thinking about how do we escape this, this situation. So I made this, this graph to kind of think about, to help people think about our theories of activism. Okay, and the, the, the revolution, which just to define what I think about revolution, revolution basically means a change in legal regime. It's when you make something that was once illegal, legal, or something that was legal, illegal. So with Occupy Wall Street, we wanted to change the law around money and politics. We wanted to make something that's legal, giving unlimited money to uh, candidates, illegal, which is a kind of revolution. Now, revolution is the intersection between the human and the natural world. And almost all activism falls in the category of voluntarism, which is the bottom left-hand corner. That means that human action creates change. Activists do actions because we believe that our action is what causes change. It's, it's a human process that intersects with the natural world. That's the most common understanding of activism, and that's kind of why people organize protests, because to change something, you need to act, right? Well, there's another option. It's called structuralism. It's the idea that revolution actually is a process that doesn't involve humans at all. It's a natural phenomenon that is the result of, for example, food prices. And there's been studies that have shown that the Arab Spring and Occupy coincided with historically high food prices. And those food prices were caused by climate change. Therefore, revolution is actually a process of natural phenomenon and that it doesn't involve human action. So you don't need to organize protests. The protests and the revolutions just kind of happen magically or without intervention of humans. Now there's a third option. This idea that, that it's a human process, but that it doesn't involve the material realm at all. And therefore, revolution is a, is a change of mind. This is the idea that basically, if you want to change reality, then change how you see reality. In this, in, this, in this kind of activism, we would just meditate and we would change our inner reality to influence external reality. And then there's the fourth possibility, which is that revolution doesn't involve, does not involve humans and is also a spiritual or supernatural process. This is the idea that revolution is some sort of act of God, that it's, a, it's an intervention of divine forces in our reality. This, of course, is the hardest, I think, for contemporary activists to even think about. 
What would that mean? God is creating revolutions? I don't get it. So I just give you one example and then I'll, and then I'll end, um, which is that the, the conquest of Christianity. Now how is it that Christianity, which was persecuted for 300 years, Christians were killed in front of cheering audiences, how is it that Christianity swept the world? Well, it was two spiritual conversions, the first of St. Paul, but the second and most significantly of Constantine. So I'll just briefly summarize that Constantine, he was going to battle against a rival emperor in Rome. When the night of the battle, the, at noon, he saw in the sky a cross. He saw a cross, so apparently his whole army saw a cross too. And then that night he dreamt that he talked to Jesus. And Jesus told him, put this cross onto your, onto your army's shields and you'll win the battle. He did so, he won the battle, he converted to Christianity, and that's, why we're, and that's why Christianity won. It was an example of a kind of divine intervention in his eyes. So I think that, the, that right now, activism needs a fundamental reorientation and innovation in the way we think about activism. We have to break the script of protest, this storyline that we've been telling ourselves. And part of that involves uh, opening ourselves to basically these four or the three other ways of thinking about activism and protest. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>